Listen to Power of Now 20 minutes every day. Do some journaling, take responsibility of where you are right now and uncover where you wanna go. And if you are feeling depressed and down, you're not happy with it, you must become the best problem solver of your own life, okay? Great, that's feedback for you. Why are you feeling down? Most people that feel depressed, right? If, if you were to do an audit, if they were to audit their own life, of course you're depressed. Of course you are, right? Greg, thank you for coming on the podcast. Really grateful and honored for you to be here. Long time. When I first started lifting weights, it was like your content and a bunch of other people who were inspiring me. So thank dude, you. Dude, hell yeah, man. I'm pumped to uh, for you to see my stuff in the in the very key days when you're getting started. Yeah, that's the important phase of life. But I would love to start with your early days mm. and more particularly a brick bazooka action figure. <laughs> what role did that play in your life? Um, when I was young, I always was very amazed by muscle and strength. And I loved like the Arnold Schwarzenegger, Van Damme, Sylvester movies. Um, you know, I grew up in the 90s. And I also like as a five or six year old, I had like a freaking box of action figures. I was obsessed with them. Um, and like one of them in particular was this brick bazooka guy that was freaking jacked. And I just always remember admiring the strength and, and the muscle um, and it was very clear to me that I, I wanted to, to, uh, train and, and gain muscle and look good. I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. But why? Uh, I wanted to have that power, you know, I wanted to feel like no one could mess with me. I wanted to feel like I was improving myself, growing. I wanted to like, be like the movie star. Like when you see that, you know, the main character in a movie that's powerful, that's strong, that's, uh, you know, I wanted to be kind of the hero of my own story. I didn't want to just sit on the sidelines. So it's very clear to me, like there was a link between having an amazing life, being powerful, being strong, taking action. You know, there's a link um, with that and like the strength, the muscle and like the training. And you saw that right away? I saw that. Yeah, I saw that right away. And even like when I was watching some of those movies, like what would really inspire me the most was like, you know, in Rocky, like when he's training and he's working out, he's doing pushups, he's boxing. Like I loved the work it took to kind of get the result. And even in a lot of the Kung Fu movies, you do see like this training component. So like I was very drawn to like the, the, the discipline and the training to get the result. It's funny because a lot of people start out and they are super interested in lifting weights, but then they're like, ah, like that's not for me. But for you, it seems like it's been literally every year you've just gotten more and more invested and interested in lifting and helping people. So why is that the case? Um, well, for me, if I love something, I like sharing it. Like if I find something really is awesome for me, I want to share it. Like when I started doing fasting, I was telling my friends, I'm like, tell my brothers, yes, what are you doing eating breakfast? We got to start fasting the benefits, you know? So when I find something I, I love, I like to share it. Hence why I started going on YouTube, um, when I was very young. Um, so that's pretty much the, that's the kind of the way my brain is wired. When I figure something out, my initial impulse is to start sharing with people yeah i am as well like i and i found from doing 300 plus episodes such a common theme for content creators and people who end up making it online is like they have that same impulse the impulse to share the impulse to look at the world and be like i like that or i dislike that and i want to tell everyone about it yeah no exactly exactly so like for you i know there were a couple of different periods in your life where you put out content but people supported it, but then they clowned it and then it, it made you insecure. Mm. Take me back to that place. Um, so there was a few moments. One was when I was probably 14 or 15 putting videos on YouTube. Um, and I actually got a lot of traction at 14, 15, um, but not necessarily the right traction. Like when you have like, like I didn't, I was 15. I was like, I was like, I wanted to inspire other teenagers, like teen workout. And I would get a lot of gay attention which, uh, you know, wasn't necessarily what I was looking for. So that sort of discouraged me because I was the wrong followers. I was trying to share fitness. And instead, I was getting very creepy messages um, as well. Like when my videos were really ripping throughout high school, everyone found out about my YouTube videos and they loved it. They're like, oh, this is awesome. Like, good for you. Wow. Like you got all this attention. Um, but I was still shy back then and didn't like my sort of YouTube online presence being like so publicly known amongst like my school and stuff. Um, but I will say that period I was posting and like, I was getting like, I, like it wasn't like I was posting and no one was seeing it. Like I was like, holy shit. Like I, if you were there, like if you uh, struck the iron while it was hot, you could get attention very easily. And then like YouTube used to have this feature 
where if you said the content was sports or entertainment, then if it ranked well in your city, in your country, it would be shown on the feed. So you used to be able to be able to like search videos differently. And a lot of times my videos would rank like top in sports and lots of people would see it. Um, that was the first time and I did like essentially delete that channel and delete all the videos. And then I started up again um, years later and that's when it was a little bit slower to take off. And that's when I kind of like had sort of my own theme of fitness. Back then I was just kind of sharing what you know I was doing. Then I had like a theme kind of going against the grain of bodybuilding and focusing more on the leanness, not obsessing about squats and deadlifts. And that's when I got a lot of flack, but the flack was good. I like bodybuilding.com was ripping me up. And then, uh, but I, I, some followers would stick and loved it. And I didn't mind, I didn't mind the negative attention. I preferred that than like the creepy messages. Yeah, that makes sense. You were also big on the forums back in the day as well. What got you so interested in forums and writing from yeah. your perspective? So I was extremely active on this one forum, Ross Training. And I just, again, like I was, I was following some of his workouts in my teenage years. And I would share, you know, what I was doing. I interact on the forum. I spent a few hours there a day. And then you start to build up like credibility on the forum. Um, so I just liked having that community to share stuff with and share workouts with um, and share progress with. It was really cool. Cause I do these workouts every day. And then I would kind of go, uh, this is when I was like 15 or 16 or 14. And then I kind of interact on the forum. It was, it was fun, you know? What would you say to somebody who's like- And also, you know what I will say, yeah. I was actually very, part of my like, um, uh, part of me connecting with the forums was also that I was pretty shy mm. and I wasn't, didn't really have a big social life. So like I would spend more time in solitude on the forums. Yeah. Well, it's like you found your tribe of people through the internet. Yeah. And today that's much more common than it was back then. Mm -hmm. Did you feel any sense of insecurity about that in your earlier years? Um, did I feel any sort, uh, sort of insecurity around I'm making friends on the internet okay, and everyone around me is making friends in real life. I mean, I, I remember reading a, an article that said where you said, I wasn't popular, but I also wasn't not popular. Yeah. And so, yeah. So, I mean, I didn't really connect the dots about like sort of me kind of feeling disenfranchised with like people in my school and me like spending a lot of time on workout forums. I didn't really connect the dots really. I didn't really, didn't even cross my mind. Um, but I did remember feeling in high school kind of like I didn't belong here. Like I didn't really connect with anyone. I looked around, I just kind of felt like just, uh, I wasn't supposed to be here. Um, you know, why did you feel that way? Uh, I don't know how to completely articulate it. Well, I did, I will say I was very, very in my head in high school. So I was shy and I'd always be in my thoughts. And so I always felt a little bit stifled, but like if I was in drama class, for example, I'd feel more free and open and I'd have fun. If I was playing, if I was in gym class or on a sports team and we're doing something and, and like training or playing a game, I'd feel much more free or open. And then we did these um, character building camping trips at my high school where we'd go kayaking for 10 days or canoeing. And then, you know, there, I guess I would, because you're somewhere for 24, like 24 seven with people, you kind of open up more than when you show up at class. It was more like, I just didn't like school. Mm. I didn't feel like comfortable in school. I didn't like school. Um, just, uh, just, you know, I just kind of felt shy and sort of withdrawn and aloof at school. Um, and part of it was because I was also not very confident and socially uh, confident. I was quite shy. So that obviously affected the way I interacted with the environment. Um, like if I could have gone back, I would have probably done it differently. Um, like if I had to relive being a 15 year old or whatever, but, but, um, yeah, I just, honestly, I just be like, I was very happy. People, some people like don't want to enter adulthood and all the responsibility that entails. I was so happy to have freedom and responsibility, do my own thing and not to show up to some stupid class and wake up at seven 30 in the morning. Like I was so happy to like not be in school. How, what would you tell a kid right now who is in that position? Um, well, I'd say like, understand your highest values. And for me, like my highest values definitely were like fitness and, and, and learning about fitness and thinking about like what I was going to do once I graduated school. So I actually spent a lot of time in school, like on the forums and reading. And then I kind of just went through the motions at school. I wasn't like that invested, and engaged, engaged in school. Um, and I was, dude, I was freaking late every day to school. <laughs> Every day I was late. There wasn't a day I was on time. And they would always, teachers, they would always be like, oh, you're late again. I'm like, 
I was I was late every day. They stopped asking. They stopped asking. I get to get permission slip every day. Um, but also like I'm a, definitely a night owl. So like the idea of waking up at seven thirty in the morning is terrible. I was like I my body like wakes up at like 10, 11. Yeah. Um, so I would dude, I was late every day. It was it was yeah. Oh school wasn't school wasn't that bad. I had some friends, like I had fun and all that. I just it just really I just didn't really feel like I I fit in. You know? Yeah. Well, the waking up at 10 or 11 is something I heard you talk about in a previous podcast. And you know what? You know what? I will say one more thing. Okay. My school was kind of bullshit. If I had to look back at it. Okay. If you ever, if you ever uh, read any Dr. David Buss, it's very interesting how like certain dynamics play out. My grade had twice as many dudes as women. So like literally twice as many guys as women. It was very, it was not good. Not a good high school because literally when... Even if there's like a ten percent more guys than women, it it tips the it tips the uh, dating dynamics. It was like t- two to one, so it was a big famoose. <laughs> it was a big famoose. Okay, I w- if next time if, if you're if you're in school and your parents are showing you around some 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 classes, forget about the teachers, forget about any of the school activities. Just be like, what's the ratio? <laughs> okay, we got two to one girl to guy. Sign me up. Speaking of that, what do you think that? young men get wrong when it comes to dating um well a lot um i'd say a lot i'd say one men do not understand actually how to like create a strong connection with a woman on a date Mm. they go about it the wrong way most guys feel like they have to impress the girl on a date they gotta tell them some really cool stories be charming and charismatic um they have to put on this show bring up little slight things that are going to impress the girl and women are very very smart they actually are a lot more socially um uh smart than men and a lot of times they'll see through that and instead okay so most guys they'll go on a date and they'll think it went amazing when it went really shitty and then like why am i getting ghosted the girl didn't message again um and they essentially just deliver themselves on a silver platter what guys that are good with women do is they talk like maybe 20 30 percent of the time they sit back and they just kind of ask questions and a lot of dating coaches will say that being the interview guy is wrong asking questions is wrong it's complete opposite um it's it's they do not know what they're talking about sure if you go and approach a girl in a club and you're asking her questions it's not going to go over very well but if you have a girl on a date and she's interested in you the only thing you're there to do is to learn as much about her get her talking get her opening up get her sharing stuff that she feels like oh my god i've been on you know, 10 dates in the last year and no one's known this much about me. Um, the more the woman starts opening up and sharing with you and the more you play a little bit of a mystery, the stronger the connection gets. And so if you can be the one really asking the questions, getting the girl to really talk, to open up and don't just stack question, question, question. Like, you know, it's like you have a question she's talking, it becomes a thread. And then the other thing that, you know, most guys do on, on dates when the girl's really freaking hot and they're, they're like, oh my God, this girl's freaking beautiful. They kind of become a bit reactive and they let the girl kind of hold the frame and they kind of react. And so the girl says, you know, this, and then, you know, she creates this hoop and then you start talking, okay, oh yeah, this is my job. This is what I do. I don't do any of that. Okay. Most often if I go on a date, uh, most times the woman will really be in her feminine because of my energy. She'll be a bit more soft and reactive and giggly. Um, but sometimes, you know, if a girl's just kind of has a bit of a harsh energy and wants to test, I will, uh, I will take over the frame and I'll ask her, you know, I'll ask her some question and then sometimes she'll try and throw it back at me and I'll just, I'll just stop like, Hey, you know, one second, like order a drink and I'll keep breaking it down. Right. I'll keep kind of breaking, creating these little micro breaks that force her to enter my frame because women like the natural dynamic between men and women is for the man to lead. Okay, when a woman is leading, okay, they don't get attracted. They don't like it. They a lot of women sometimes they have to lead. They have no choice but to lead because their guy doesn't know how to lead effectively. He's not taking action. He's not assertive. He doesn't have strong boundaries. He doesn't have the skill set to really let the woman just be able to relax and follow. You know, because that's the natural accordance, and it doesn't have to be like that all the time. Um, but in general, the man is leading, right? Um, and so you want to be in a position where, you know, you can hold the frame. Why have men become more feminine and women become more masculine over the past 30 years in our lifetimes? 
Um, well, there's probably many different reasons and I don't, I haven't like, you know, really like put together a thesis on this, but I can say there's many, di there's probably different reasons. Um, I'd say a lot of men are growing up in single, single homes with a single mom. I mean, I know I grew up in, you know, my father passed away when I was 11. Um, and so pretty much 12 on, I didn't really have a, a father role model and I had to figure this stuff out completely on my own. Um, it makes a big difference if you have like a father there to kind of show you the ropes, especially in your teenage years, early twenties. So I think more now than ever, uh, men are kind of being growing up in single family homes. Um, that's sort of one reason. I mean, we are seeing a, a pretty massive drop in testosterone across the board in men. Um, and that can, that can have a, like that biology can have effect on actions and stuff like that. Um, but mostly, you know, what do you think, by the way? I think there's so many different factors out there. There's one of them I would say is education. And we, we've put education on a pedestal for women. Mm -hmm. And so women become more and more educated and thus it is leading to a society where women are outpacing men in yeah. education, but now they're seeking for, and, and I, there's, well, you know what I will say, you know, I, I'm pretty sure as far as the research I've seen, uh, women in like their, you know, late twenties, early thirties are outperforming men in their late twenties, uh, early thirties in the job market. Yeah. Um, that's true like, uh, for the majority. I mean, at the very top echelon of success, I believe you do see more men in, in, uh, uh, still outperforming. Um, but there's different variables for that. Um, but even like in our culture, you know, TV shows and movies, the, what we're seeing is very, very different. The male female dynamics you see in TV shows these days are very different than what it was 30 years ago. Um, so there's different sort of reasons, um, for, you know, what's going on. Yeah. Well, what do you, how do you think about that? As, well, you mentioned before about your father passing away when you were 11 and I'm curious, like, how does somebody even think about that situation at 11, at 13, at 15? And now like how, how has that situation changed in your mind over your lifetime? Oh, well, you know, if eventually you do become like, you do, uh, like pretty much become like come at peace with it. Mm. Um, so like a certain point I kind of just, you know, realized, you know, I had an amazing father essentially like, you know, I, I share blood with him and, uh, he played a massive role on my life. Even after he passed away by the way, he lived his life, what I knew about him, even my, uh, time with him. And I'm very fortunate for that. I would rather have that than pretty much anyone else's father. Who's, you know, lived till their eighties or, or so. Um, losing a father at 11 or 14 or six is very different than losing a father when you're 22 or 32, 42. It is night and day different. Losing a father when you're 25 or 35 is hard. Losing a father when you're a kid, it feels like your entire world is crumbling around you. You see the difference when you have like a father and a mother versus, you know, also you have the pain of losing, you know, that father. But you see the difference between when you just have like a mother raising you. It like, you know, it's very, very different. Um, and it's almost, there is like this sort of level of anxiety going on and stress. Um, and again, every relationship can be different, but I do know my, you know, uh, probably my father was definitely the more grounded, calm, created that strong base. And my mother can be like, you know, she is extremely sweet. will go the extra mile for anyone really loving, but she can be a little more like volatile and stressed and anxious. And so you kind of just grow up just kind of feeling like this stress and anxiety. Um, and again, these roles can be different for different couples, different people. Um, but like, I do know, like the, my father definitely played a very powerful role. Um, so, you know, that definitely is a factor. Yeah. Well, as I understand it, when you were growing your business, your mother was harder on you in part, you believe potentially because your father wasn't there. So she was trying to play that role yeah. to be the aggressive one and tell you, and push back against your business pursuits. Yeah, she definitely, you know, she was definitely, you know, worried about me and not going to school and my father not there and, and her being like, oh, you know, you know, I wish he was here. And then, uh, yeah, she kind of overcompensated and, and would try and be like very, very hard, um, which, you know, looking back is completely fine. But in the moment, definitely like just kind of felt like no matter what I did, I'd never get that sort of validation or approval. Um, but it also did like, motivate me to work very, very hard. So like, and again, people have, we will always have their different way of showing their love. 
Um, a lot of times, like with family members behind certain things, it, it seems like harsh and whatever, but there's usually love behind it. Um, so, you know, my mom definitely uh, like that was her way, you know, and probably she was raised uh, a certain way. Um, but you know what? Like it just it, it's like the, the big kind of thing that I kind of realized was, uh, you know, I mean, I, I do have an amazing family. I have four siblings, mother, like a ton of love in my life. And so I did lose the fa my father very young. And that was very, very hard. But I, in you know, grand scheme of things, I am very fortunate and lucky. And, it, and it's good to always keep the glass half full. You know, like you could lose your father at 11. I could have lost both my parents in a car accident. So when you, it's all, everything is perception. You can perceive something as being like terrible and unfair and poor me. And then you can let that uh, hurt your human experience, your life. Um, or you can just be like, you know, you know, shit like this happened, you can take the loss and you can appreciate the time you had, appreciate the lessons you have and appreciate and look at the glass half full and look at all the love, you know, you have in your life. And I think that anyone that's going through a loss, especially a really, really hard loss, um, you know, at a certain point, maybe it takes a few years, whenever it is, um, it's good to just look at the glass half full and appreciate the time you had with that person and appreciate, you know, the love and the good you have in your life. Because some people will never be happy, you know? It will never, everything will always be wrong and shouldn't be this, shouldn't be that. And that way of thinking uh, destroys your human experience. Um, and so it's always good to, you know, no matter what, try and come back to like looking at the glass half full and appreciation. Yeah, well, it sounds like you're not arguing with reality. And when we don't argue with reality, we are inherently more at peace. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, what would you tell that 11 year old kid so that he could have a better experience? Or what do you wish that 11 year old kid knew? Um, well, you know what, like the way I went through things, you know, it all, everything really worked out. And, you know, it was very, very hard. You know, I remember like crying pretty much every single day, twice a day, and then you cry twice a week, and then once a week, and then once every two weeks, and then once a month, and then, and then, you know, once every six months, and then, you know, and then it's just like, and then, so like it is, there is a process you have, like you have to sort of kind of go through. Um, but, you know, it, it is, you know, even after he passed away, like, you know, I did at very many moments feel very close to him and feel his love and stuff and feel his spirit. Um, so, I mean, I don't think I would even change really a thing. I think that um, it, uh, I think like, you know, everyone's got like, you know, their own kind of timeline, but. I just really wanted to make him proud and I just really felt a ton of pressure to figure things out and okay, you know what, like, and my father did extraordinarily well, did like incredibly well, um, just as in accomplishments were absolutely insane. And so, you know, I'm sure like part of me like felt, oh yeah, you know, I'll get a job in the company and I'll learn everything about him and then and I'll learn everything, you know, whatever. And we did sell his company um, a couple years after he passed away. And so like, I just knew like, I was like, shit, I gotta, I have to figure out what I need to do to become successful. I have to like figure out how to accomplish my goals. And, and I didn't have this feeling ever where I was gonna turn 22 or 25 and 30 even, and just have a uh, fortune handed to me. I knew that wasn't the way it was gonna be done. And so I always knew that if I wanted to like succeed, I had to be from myself. Um, so a lot of people assume that every kid that is born into a multi, multi millionaire family doesn't have to work. It's not actually not true. Um, my father wanted his kids to be hyper incentivized and to work and to be motivated. And that meant not giving them, uh, you know, some insane amount of money so they could sit on their ass and do whatever they wanted. Um, a lot, I know a lot of rich parents, their kids get tons of money and don't have to worry about working. Um, but just that was to my father building his business and, you know, creating his company was so much more fulfilling than the money that came. And so he didn't, he didn't want to steal that from his kids. Um, and he, he probably believed that it was very, very important for them to, to build themselves up and, and to accomplish things and to become men and, and, uh, not just get money handed. So, and I think, you know what, I think that was the right decision for sure. Um, I think like if, you know, I think that, uh, for sure, if I just knew that I was going to be set, I probably wouldn't have gone through the things I've gone through to build my business. What lessons from your parents do you take and you're going to want to instill in your children? And what mm -hmm. lessons are you going to want to do the opposite of what they did? Um, you know, 
uh, I haven't even like analyzed this and nothing is really coming to mind. I, when I have, when I have children, I'll have to think about that a little, little more deeply, but you know, I know that, uh, you know, I, I mean, my father was very focused, even when we were kids, set goals, um, you know, treat people well, work hard, whether it was like school or whether it was sports, like work hard, you know, be hungry for the puck and hockey. Like he wanted, yeah, that's what he said. Like, you know, you wanted us to work hard and that was really, really important. He wanted us to like, he just told us like math is important. English is important. You know, everything else is bullshit. <laughs> just kidding. But that's what he said. He said, do well in math and English. That that's important. Um, set a lot of lots of goals, um, and uh, you know that was pretty much it. And I, I I would definitely teach when I have kids. I definitely teach them uh, very similar similar things. Um, I my father definitely didn't put as much emphasis on health and fitness as he should. He was a strong guy and lifted and played sports, but when he focused on his company, he didn't. He put a hundred percent into his company, but he didn't take care as much of his health and fitness as he could. And I really, but you know, like I, uh, it wasn't like we could eat junk all day. Like we, they were, my parents were strict. Like we wouldn't have ice cream all the time and like eat your dinners and stuff like that. But I mean, you know, I think my father, um, like with my kids, I would definitely, uh, you know, make sure I'm, I'm, and you know what, when I was younger, we do pushups and you go jogging. But as he got later in life and as I got older, it kind of just uh, put, you know, was, eating less healthy and, and kind of not hitting the gym as much. And I would make sure to continue that, you know, um, continue that more, but you know, it's tough because I think like, even when I was nine was when he got diagnosed so that things changed. So it's hard for me to understand it fully, but I do also like, I, you know, I know that he was a bit of a workaholic and he would work pretty much all the time and Monday through Friday, like 12 hours a day minimum, and then half day on Saturday. So I would see him for a few minutes at night and then a little bit on the weekend. Um, I definitely would, you know, I definitely want to spend a bit more time with uh, my kids, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, what suggestions do you have for people who are incredibly busy building companies, but also to not lack their health and fitness? Right. Well, I mean, I am a big believer that if you do things correctly, you can have your cake and eat it too. Um, have two very key workouts in the gym where you go in the gym, you track your workouts, you hit the weights, you hit your key lifts, um, like always hit the weights twice a week. You can get a lot out of it twice a week. I actually just lift twice a week and then make time to walk. And if you're working like crazy and you don't have time to walk, get a, get a standing walking desk or get on a call and just walk in circles, walk, 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 hit 10,000 steps a day. Um, do a short fast every day and, you know, eat like lunch, dinner, little nighttime snack, and just be somewhat conscious of how much you're putting in your body. You're not going over crazy. Like I don't track my calories, um, in my phone. I just kind of guesstimate and I kind of have certain rules I follow. And then I kind of eat, you know, till, till I'm satisfied, but just, you know, do a little short fast, you know, eat, eat high quality food and, uh, don't over, overdo your calories. And, you know, you can get phenomenal results if you, hit the weights twice a week, get a decent amount of walking in, you know, on the weekend, you know, maybe, maybe go for some sprints or do a longer walk outside. Um, but a lot of this Western mentality is that you have to go all out or nothing. Mm. You have to be in the gym five days a week, weights, cardio, you gotta be eating the strict meal. And so a lot of people are disenfranchised in fitness because like, the, well, I can't do that. And then, well, this is not gonna get me any results. Well, actually, if you're strategic and you know what you're doing, two lifts a week in the gym, some walking a little fast and keeping your calories on point, eating good food and some protein and even fitting in chocolate or cookies in your calories at night is totally fine. That's all I do. And I've achieved like very, very solid condition. In fact, I had like a post I put on Twitter. I had Twitter, but I never used it. I had some videos going up on Twitter. I, I put a post and I, I was pumped. The lighting was good. I looked pretty damn jacked. And I, I said like, if people knew they could actually build a really great physique, with just two workouts a week, a lot more people would be inspired to be fit. And someone reposted the video or the, the clip, the photo on Twitter and said he forgot to talk about the steroids and the whole Twitter thing was going off on it. People were backing me. Well, no, he's done blood work with uh, Derek Moore plates. He's one of the few naturals. Other people were like, no way, that's possible two days a week in the gym. Elon Musk engaged in the thread and said hilarious comments, emoji face. 
Elon, if you're watching, I am natural. I will do any test, any day, any time, carbon isotope, blood work, anything. I am natural, okay? I will get you on the system. I will transform you. I even said, I said, I said, look, I said, I said, look, I will get, if I can't get Elon in shape, I will put a Tesla tattoo on my left butt cheek, okay? I will do it. And I really do not want to fucking test. I have one tattoo for my father. I'm not getting a second tattoo because Elon, I will promise you'll get in shape. But, um, but that's the truth. You can get in great shape if you know what you're doing with a lot less work than people think. And it's not about being in the gym five, six days a week. Being in the gym is not important. Walking to a gym does not mean anything. What means something is effort and pushing yourself hard and producing a positive change. You can be in the gym six days a week for two hours and do nothing. You could also go into the gym once a week, push hard, track certain lifts, add a rep here. Maybe once a week's not optimal, but you can get better results doing that than half-assing it. If you walk into the gym, anyone can, anyone can be honest. Go into the gym today, okay? Look around. How many people are, pushing, are actually pushing the envelope and actually applying good effort? They're stopping the sets and they don't even look tired. They can, they can talk and do sets. They're like half-assing it. No one's tracking any of the workouts. No one knows how many reps they have to do to actually produce a change. And so the whole idea like, oh, two workouts a week, three workouts a week, shut the fuck up, okay? I've seen you work out. I know exactly who's saying it. The guys that are like five, right? Like, oh, you know, do to do Hey, you know, oh, what about the, you know, the, you know? Like, what about the reports that John sent over? Okay, you know, it's just like, you aren't training, okay? Training twice a week is worth more than working out six days a week because people work out, they're not actually pushing themselves. They're not tracking lifts. So I've actually learned that I can get insane results with two workouts a week. Now, part of that is, is I've trained for 20 years. I've lifted for 20 years. I'm not gonna start hitting crazy PRs for three months straight. Right now, it's a lot of, a lot of it is like simply just maintaining my strength and size. Um, and like right now, I will not get better results training three days a week. There's like, I will, like my best results are twice a week because I get more recovery. I'm not gonna be able to produce crazy strength gains anymore. And with two workouts a week, my appetite's lower. When I'm hitting the weights more often, I wanna eat more to put on that size, but I'm just trying to stay around 175, 176, be as chiseled as possible and have good strength. So twice a week works perfectly. When you're building up your strength to like close to like your limits, three days a week works best 80% of the time. And then maybe a few months go down to twice. And then once you've really built up a good base that you're happy with, just do twice a week. And if you don't care about getting to the strength as fast as possible, and you just want to kind of have fun, then you can lift twice a week. And I've kind of cracked the code to like building your physique off twice a week. I have clients that are crushing and getting the same results as my guys doing three days a week. So it can work very, very well if you know what you're doing. I can't help but notice in that entire rant, the amount of charisma that's oozing through your veins. How does somebody become more charismatic? Um, okay. Okay. Good question. So there is like some people just are more naturally gifted for charisma. And again, when I talked about dating earlier, a lot of guys are trying to put on a show. Um, that advice is good for people that naturally are a bit more charismatic where they need, they need to kind of just be a bit more chill. Don't be too try hard, kind of hold back and let the kind of girl come forward. Some guys just are like so boring to listen to. It's like watching paint dry. Like I, I saw this ad I saw this ad, it was like a political ad. And I'm like, who is listening to this guy? He is so damn boring. Holy shit. Um, so if that's you, if you're the freaking guy that's boring, you start talking and people tune out and people are like, when is this guy gonna shut up? Um, then you need to work on that. So obviously when you talk about things that you like and you can create really, what it is is in, uh, in Enter the Dragon by Bruce Lee. He was in the very beginning, uh, he had this pupil that was asking him for advice and he was doing some combo. And, you know, Bruce Lee was like, no, no, like, like again, again, or whatever. And he, and he said, you're missing emotional content. So the way to be more charismatic is actually to sort of get into your body and feel the emotions. There's something called energy transference. If I am feeling really, really good, then automatically you're, that energy and that feeling is gonna transfer onto you. And if I'm feeling amazing passion talking about something, that's gonna transfer to you and it's also gonna transfer to the viewer. I know a video is gonna hit when I feel those emotions when I'm saying it. And then sometimes, you know, if I have to do a video a lot over and over and over again, and it's coming out mechanically, I'm like, yeah, this is, gonna, this is not gonna be good. Um, so you want to create that feeling that 
of passion or of energy or even of anger, if you're speaking about something that frustrates you, you don't want to hide those emotions. You want to actually kind of connect with those emotions. And that will be way more powerful. I mean, I had a video and it was extremely successful as an ad. And it was like the video, the who else video. And I felt all those emotions. I'm like, who else? Who else is showing blood work, DEXA scans, elite lifts? Who else? And I was, and I wasn't like saying it in a salesy way. I was saying it like literally like, like Brad Pitt and Troy. Is there no one else? And that shit worked. So you have to actually like get into your body, feel the emotions. And as you talk, let that feeling come out. You do not have to be the most slick speaker in the world. You can stumble a little bit. You can mess up a little bit, but you have to be real. Yeah. Um, and that's the key. If you're real, then people will pay attention. And at, human beings were hardwired to get to pay attention when they feel like there's some emotion spike. If there's a spiked emotion, want to pay attention. Some anger, why is he angry? Or like, you know, oh, what's, what's he so excited about? Or what's he sad? Like, so we draw into emotions. And so in your content, if you can create, like, I mean, one of the best emotions would be enthusiasm. When you feel really enthusiastic, your brain sort of gets tripped wired into being like, oh, this is really, really important. Look how enthusiastic he is. This is important, you know? It's like a, almost like a cognitive bias. And so whereas when you speak very bored, your, your brain is like, he could be telling me exactly how not to get murdered tonight. Some serial killer, but I'm like, I don't care. He, he sounds bored, so this is not important. You know, or here, you know, someone would be talking about how to make $100 million or whatever, or, or you know, there's buried treasure over here, but you still, yeah, you know, it's, you're like boring. So in order for humans to pay attention, you have to create the emotion to connect them to listen. And this is also why school is bullshit, right? Because most of these teachers are just going through the motions. They're not, they're not engaged. They're not enthusiastic. They're not passionate. If everyone was to be honest, they probably can think of one teacher they actually liked. One. At most. And that was the one with the enthusiasm. That was the one that was enthusiastic. And you actually were loved going to class and you actually were motivated. And he actually explained why this was important. And you're, and so you, your brain bought in. When your brain buys in, you listen, you learn. And your IQ is like activated. When your brain is not bought in, you're literally working on 20% of your intelligence. Um, and so this is why school is bullshit is that most of these teachers are just showing up to get through the day. They're not showing up to learn. And there's no incentive plan where if a teacher is better, there's no benefit for them. So the, the model's pretty much broken where there's great teachers that can be amazing and get the same result as dog shit teachers. Um, and so it's really not their fault, but the incentive plan is sort of broken. If they had a way to actually test students' engagement and how much they're applying themselves and how much they're excited to come to class and then have bonuses um, in relation to that, and then, you know, if, if kids are completely disenfranchised, the board, you know, then there's, they're, they're, you know, or just they get a flat and they only, you know, it, people would be much better off. So we mentioned the charisma being one reason why your content has been successful. What are some of the less obvious reasons why you've been able to stick around for 15 years, probably longer, 20 yeah. years on the internet, basically? Yeah, I get very, very good results. My clients get extremely good results. Um, I stick to a simple theme. If you can watch my videos for many years and I'm pretty damn consistent with the training, the nutrition, the fasting, there's a system. Um, people, even if they follow me, then fall off and do some other workouts. They usually come back because they do get such good results. In my program, they get the best benefit with the least effort. Um, so people tend to always come back to me. Um, and I really do believe as far as getting lean, as far as mastering fat loss and making it easy. I do believe there's not anyone else that understands it and can teach it and impress upon it and get people results like me. And I say that like literally matter of factly, like if there was someone else better at helping people get lean, get below 10% body fat, make it stick, stay there for life, feel good. I would be curious because I would actually like pay attention and learn. But most of the guys, even the ones that are very, very smart in the research, they can't do it in practice. And they don't really have many clients to, to show you. They may have a few clients a year. I have clients every single week getting lean. And I have clients that are getting lean just doing my program, okay? They just follow it. There's no contact. And then, you know, I have my clients that really freaking crush it. But a lot of people just see do my program, no contact, and, and get chiseled. Um, so we do get the best results. Um, I do believe my fitness angle is very, very unique. So it, it, people love it. People love the idea of, of, uh, of like being, making fitness a lifestyle, looking like a movie star, being strong. Um, I am like, a, like 
I, a lot of men will follow me. And one of the reasons they follow me is they do want to be like me. They see that I have the certain result, the confidence, the style, the girl, the X, Y, and Z, and they're attracted to the sort of aspirational lifestyle. I'm not just some guy that's obsessed with working out. That's kind of boring and a dud. They kind of can relate to me like, oh, I could freaking hang out with that dude. He seems chill. Like I could, you know, get a drink with him or, or whatever. So a lot of guys kind of just feel like they could be buddies with me. Um, and then there's an aspirational element. Um, and I understand that. I mean, I remember when I was very young, you know, I'd look up to certain people and kind of want to learn from them and, and be like them and, 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 you know, oh, cool. What shirt is he wearing? I like that shirt. I'm going to get that shirt. I, I, I remember feeling like that, you know? Um, so I understand it fully. I think that that plays into a lot of it. If you, if you're going to be a leader, you have to, I mean, even, you know, Jordan Belfort talked about this in sort of Wolf of Wall Street, like for him to lead all these guys to freaking, you know, kill it for him every single day and be on the phones 12 hours a day. Um, they wanted to like, be like him. If he was some boring loser, uh, they wouldn't be as motivated. And so in any sort of leadership in any sort of company brand you're building, you do want to be sort of like a, like an aspirational figure for your followers in more ways than one. So if I was, if it was just fitness, just the body, but my life kind of seemed boring, didn't seem like I, I had what they wanted. Um, that would be boring. The connection that people want that, that people want to make is they want to be like, oh shit, you know, Greg's life or, you know, oh shit, John's life looks really fucking cool. And he's like teaching fitness. Awesome. If I kind of follow his fitness approach and learn from him and watch his videos, I can probably create a, a cool life like him, you know? Um, and fitness was really the first thing that really gave me that confidence, gave me the confidence in dating and, uh, in business in in putting myself out there. Um, and I believe that when you get to that next echelon of fitness, I'm not talking about getting big and getting on steroids. But when you get to that lean chisel look, you do separate from the pack. And there is a, a secret advantage when you can like look like the movie star. That's sick. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So talk to me about mushrooms. Right. Okay. What, what role have mushrooms played in your life? Well, I didn't really do mushrooms until I was 26 years old. Um, and you know, my first experience with it was really, really good. Um, I do find it, it mushrooms is a way to kind of open up your perception. You, you get a different perspective on your life, the things you're going through, relationships, work, et cetera. Um, you feel like your heart chakra just feels blasted open. You feel so much love. What is, what is chakras? I, uh, I don't know, understand. Bro, I just, I had this freaking guy once and, and, and you, I was asking him questions about mushrooms and different things like that. And he was like, oh yeah, blast open your heart chakra. So I say it more sarcastically. <laughs> I just say it, it blast open your, <laughs> I say it sarcastically, bro. I thought you were going to give little, me some science. These, like. No, these little, these little terms, bro. Like the people, like I just create my, I see someone say that. I'm like, bro, that's fucking hilarious. A lot of times people think, say, say things dead ass serious. And I'm like, that's fucking hilarious. I say it sarcastically. Okay. But it, the feeling of, of blasting open your heart chakras, a lot of times we kind of have a shield over our heart and we're kind of, you know, living not in love, but we're living in fear. Yes. Fear of putting ourselves out there. Fear, of, you know, this. So, Oh, you know, my, my brother and, you know, there's fear between us. I, I can't just give him love because I'm scared of this and that. There's all these different. So most people you're living out of fear and you're blocked. Um, you have a shield over your heart. You know, I feel like most of us don't just wear our heart on our sleeve. Most of us are, you know, as we go through life, we're pretty like pulled back. And so mushrooms, as far as blasting open your heart chakra, you just feel that a lot of times that fear or, or any pain or any sort of um, animosity is sort of like, it's distorted love. And you start to be like, holy shit, there's so much love with, uh, between me and this person and all this miscommunication and all this stuff is really just an illusion. And, and there's so much love, this person loves me, you know? And I love this person. So you do enter a state of just love. You feel so much love, um, you feel deep presence. It's not about being here or not about hanging on to your past. It's about being right here in the moment. This moment's so beautiful. Wow. I feel so appreciative. Um, you feel like a complete fullness in life. A lot of the things that mushrooms does, you can get to with meditation. If you listen to Eckhart Tolle's teachings, it all brings you to the same place. It's almost like mushrooms is like a freaking short circuit to get there. Um, it's also like a nice reset where every single day when you have emotional stress, pain, work, X, Y, and Z, things that are weighing on you and you don't do like the work every single day, you get this cumulative buildup of stress. 
that can kind of wear you down. And where, whereas if you were to do like a you know small dose of mushrooms once in a blue moon, it would kind of release that. It'd give you a little bit of a reset. Um, and uh, and it's a beautiful experience. It's a very very beautiful experience. I have a very, you know, I, like I'm not one to really always recommend things, but I think that, you know, if you're over 25 and you have like a pretty, you know, even, even head on your shoulders. Um, and you know, I think it's an incredibly beautiful experience for someone to, to have, it is an incredible, beautiful experience. And if anyone's caught up in like drinking too much or, you know, God forbid, like hard drugs, doing mushrooms will make the feeling of anything else feel trivial, feel like nothing, feel like garbage. Um, the feeling of drunk like garbage. Um, it's just such a beautiful, full, serene experience. Um, it's lasting, it like it lasts for a few hours and then it slowly kind of, you know, you come out of it, but you come out of it in a very good place. So it is a very, very beautiful experience. Um, and I know some people that are really against sort of drugs and against anything that affects your mind. Um, any sort of like uh, thing that's hallucinogenic. I mean, look, you, if you don't want to do it, you absolutely don't have to do it. Um, but like the, for me, like mushrooms isn't trying to hallucinate. It's not trying to create some crazy experiences and have fun. It's really about how can I, what am I not seeing right now? Where am I living in, out of fear? Where am I not seeing the love in my life? It's more about connecting with myself and it's a tool that you can use to like really uh, audit your life almost and audit your relationships and audit your feelings. And, um, I've had a really good experience with mushrooms. That said, if you're doing it every week, if you're doing it to party, if you're doing it for as an escapism, which it can be, then that's definitely not good. So I, for me, I really find like, you know, I have to force myself to do mushrooms. Like I, 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 I go months without doing it. I'm like, you know, I, I want to do it, but like, it is a big time investment. Like you are like fucking little, like you got, it's a few four or five hour time investment. So like, I really like, I really, uh, I really like, you know, force myself to do it. And, and so I, it's not like I, I'm like, oh my God, I want to do it. It's like, I, I, I force myself to it, it. I see the benefits and I haven't seen any issues, um, with doing it. I just would recommend like, if you are someone that has an addictive personality, you are someone that has you know, maybe a screw loose, it's probably not a good thing. Um, but if you have a good head on your shoulders and like, it's funny, like the people that really want to do mushrooms might not always be the right, the best people who, or who needs it the most. It's the people that actually don't want to do it, that are resistant to it, that actually need it the most. Yeah. Well, how, mushrooms are something that is pretty- Just, just like, and just, sorry, just, uh, yeah. it's just like the people that really, really hate working out a certain muscle group. Oh, I hate working out, those are the ones that need it or hate doing a certain workout, those are the ones that need it mixed martial arts that hate doing cardio. Those are the ones that need it. Yep. So same thing, really. It's like what we resist is actually the thing that we need. Yeah. So, but you know, mushrooms are, are one of these things where it's like, it's very, it's, you can talk about it in the common culture today, mm -hmm. but how do you think about things you can and won't say publicly? And mm -hmm. how do you bridge the line between the things that you feel versus the things that you can actually share or, from your perspective, it's like everything is fair game. Right. Um, I, under I understand the question. You can, you know, there's certain ways like where you can hit like sort of like off limit territory, but you can kind of like do it in a, you can, the key is letting people read between the lines. Interesting. So you can kind of like have certain, like imply certain things without outright saying anything that, uh, that uh you know goes too far in the certain landscape we live in where where people are freaking crazy but i think that things are tipping back and we are seeing a bit more freedom of speech and we are seeing a little bit more balanced conversation that's very very good and very very powerful and that should be a good thing for pretty much everyone um any sort of restricted speech or any sort of conversation that is silenced is uh usually it's usually good masquerading uh, or, or it's it's evil masquerading as good Oh, you know, we're doing this to avoid hurting people's feelings. It's all garbage. Um, you have to have the ability to have conversations and you have to have the ability to, um, you know, you have to have the ability to have to, to, to say things and have disagreements and, and have, you know, this is very, very important. And once you take that away, then, uh, and again, you have to understand that the power, uh, most power is from the government, right? So the individuals, like what I like about the US is that 
Um, in the states, one of the things that was very important in the states is keeping your government in check. And I think that's incredibly important. I think Canadians, um, I think so a lot of Canadians do get it, but, but a lot of Canadians are completely um, uh, childish, um, dumb, like, I, you know, they're, they're, they're completely naive is the word. Um, the reality is, is that when the government has too much power and they always get, they don't get power by telling you, um, oh, you know, you know, by trying to restrict your, your freedoms for no reason, they always do it with a hidden, like they, they always do it with good intention. Oh, we're doing this for you, for you. And, 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 you know, if you have an IQ, you can see through it and you can see where this goes and the, you know, you see the government always goes too far. And just, just like when, you know, we acquiesced for the lockdowns, we acquiesced for the mass, we acquiesced for X, Y, and Z. We kept acquiescing, you know, it, it, it just became more and more and more and more. And it wasn't until we sort of pushed back and said, you know, enough's, enough's enough that like we finally got some semblance of, of normality back. At least that was the way in Canada. And so if you keep acquiescing, then you're gonna be living in a world with very little freedom. And so you have to understand that um, the government and, and, and the way the power is structured, they want, they, it's not like they don't want power. Of course they want more power. They, of course they want more power. Um, and so keeping the government in check is the most important thing that you, know, you can do. And I think the states seems to do a better job at that, although it's not even perfect. Um, but I do understand like they, they do have that sort of um, ingrained in their culture. Grego Gallagher is president and obviously you can't be president of the united states as current rules suggest but if you were president of the united states what is one action you would make sure every american citizen had to take every day um well as far as a daily action that americans have to take every day um can you give me an example like let's say you're a dictator actually okay so like you have the power. To okay, I understand the question now. Yes. Okay, so if I was president of the United States, okay, A, right? There's no more breakfast. Any of these breakfast restaurants, we're shutting them down. We're all fasting, non-negotiable, okay? There's no more loud chewing, okay? You're not allowed to be a loud chewer anymore. That shit drives me freaking crazy. Um, we're gonna set the sleeping temperatures to at least 64 degrees. Anything higher than that is pish posh. Okay, I... <laughs> Um, you but, really sleep at 62 degrees. I sleep at like, bro, 62, like I can sleep at 64, 65 with a fan on. I can do it, but like 62 is my shit. Wow. Yeah. And you know what, you know what the sign is, the sign that a girl freaking really loves you is that when like, she really like, it's like, fuck it. She's like, oh yeah, I like it cold. And then when they adapt to that, I'm like, oh shit, she loves me <laughs> when she's like, yeah, I like it cold too. And then, you know, they bundle up, you know? Just like for me, like a lot of like strong cologne, perfume, scents, it bothers me. And if I find a girl's like really falling in love with me, then she starts like, oh my God, this Uber had so much air freshener, it gave me a headache. They, like they literally create the same thing as, you know, I've seen it. I've seen it. Yeah. So, okay. So no breakfast. Yeah. No chewing. 62 degrees for sleeping conditions. Well, so I mean, I mean, uh. Um, like obviously if I was president, I wouldn't want to create any things that people have to do. I'd want people to have more freedom. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it's funny, you know, I'm looking at the U S and moving here. The U S tax code is, is like insane. It is so complicated and confusing. You guys got some crazy tax code here, but I, I would, um, you know, I, I, there's quite, I would, you know, create a bit more freedom, a little bit less, you know, rules. Um, but yeah, I have to think about it a bit more. Yeah. Well, I do like how they're doing things in Florida. I will say that. I think Florida's doing an amazing job. Why? What are they doing? Well, particular? I mean, so I great. think it's one of the few states that actually brings in more money than it spends. Uh, it feels safe here. I'm not going to lie. Like in Florida, Miami, it feels really, really safe. Um, you know, the taxes are lower. People seem happier here. You go into LA and it, it's like people freaking seem like kind of miserable. And you get into LA and the energy feels off. Yes. Um, and, and the crime is out of control the the uh debt per capita is insane and again like if a country if a state keeps losing money and still running at massive deficits over and over and over again like i think a lot of people don't understand what that means um but the fact that florida i'm pretty sure and texas i'm pretty sure by and large are actually uh cash positive i have to you can fact check me on that but i'm pretty sure that's what i read um is actually pretty cool yeah 
it's rare in today's day and age. Yeah. I, I want to talk about and the, and the way they handled you know the pandemic and, and the way they they allowed businesses to stay open. They allowed people to continue to. Uh, make an income for their family. They allowed businesses not to lose all of their money and 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 just have businesses destroyed. The way they fought hard to keep things open um, was good, and I really really support that. And a lot of other states and a lot of other countries, even when they knew the benefits of locked or the benefits of lockdown or the benefits of staying open, way far outweighed. Um, the, you know, any issues of the lockdowns, like they kept doing it. It just, it seems very, like, it seems pretty, uh, pretty bad, man. Well, it's hard when people have, nefarious <laughs> people are become, they buy into a position mm -hmm. and then it's hard for them to look at a different position and think it's correct. Right. I mean, if anyone kind of last few years that you kind of have to create a lot of distrust with the government, um, simply because I mean, a lot of relationships, families, crushed uh life savings crushed businesses crushed um lives people have died suicide drug overdoses a lot of horrific things happen um because human beings are not wired to be stuck in an apartment 24 7 and uh you know it's it's pretty you know and we're not you know it's it's so i mean that stuff's pretty damn pretty damn bad you know yeah but back to the individual and the human being you've said before that the number one thing that allows you to work hard is having self-belief. Yeah. How do people gain self-belief? Right. I mean, there is some element of just fucking having like deeply just having this innate self-belief. Um, everyone kind of knows that one person that just always seems, you know, really self-assured. It's not always a good thing if it's not built out of reality. Um, but though, here's the way you get self-belief. Okay. And again, most people's minds are screwed on backwards. They have the wrong mental model and they start making some progress. Like, oh, I got so far to go or start making progress. Oh, but you know, Greg's way ahead of me and Greg benches 315 and this and that, I'm never gonna get there. Most people actually um, destroy their brain's own ability to, to produce dopamine by their perception. Um, and so the way, the way that you build self-belief is you set small goals. You hit off these first small goals. And as you get those goals, you, you, you don't say, well, fuck, I got so much longer to do, or, oh, this guy lifts this much, or this guy makes this much, or you don't do that, okay? Your self-esteem is linked, okay, with your success. And so whenever you talk down to yourself, you break your self-esteem and you take low-level actions. Um, and the same thing is, again, I coach people to get very, very lean. If you screw up your diet and then you start telling you, oh, I'm a failure, I'm a, that does not help you, that, that hurts you. That makes things worse, you know? If I screw up on a diet or a client, I just... What you do is you just say, well, you know, mess up a little bit. I'm only human. It happens. Hey, last week I messed up twice. This week I only messed up once. We're making some progress. Now let's see if I can go two weeks without messing up. And Or last week I ate, I went a thousand guys over. This week I only made 800. Okay, so great. That's awesome. Now let's learn from it. Why did I mess up? Why did I go over my calories? Oh shit, like, you know, maybe this I ate this meal. It didn't fill me up. So you always want to learn from it. But going back to the previous example, right? So you make a small win and you give yourself encouragement. Pound the back. Hell yeah, you know? Okay, great. We're lifting the five pound dumbbells. This is awesome. I was doing three pounds last week. And you're like, fuck yeah, I'm a freaking machine. You know, you, you get, you pump yourself up. You pump yourself up. I'm crushing it. Yes. Hey, you know what? I did my first fast. I fasted for the first four hours of the day. Fuck yeah. I am, look at me. I don't care if you got 40 pounds of fat. Look in the mirror, but like, I'm dead sexy. Oh yeah. Like you lose your first pound. Get, make it fun. Make achieving your goals fun. But most people look in the mirror like, oh, fuck, I still look like shit. I lost three pounds, but I'm still a piece of shit. If I had to start from scratch all over again and I had 50 pounds of fat to lose and I was not strong, I was fairly whatever average, I would start being like, I would be confident. I'd be like, damn, I'm down five pounds. I hit my first chin up, you know, and I don't care what anyone else is doing. The point is, is that I'm improving. I'm improving. And that's the, that's how you're going to A, build self-belief, B, increase your self-esteem, and C, again, your perception and how you talk to yourself can influence yourself on a much deeper level than we understand or that, that people even understand or think. Yeah. And so I can create a different dopamine response based on how I'm, I'm saying something. I can train my dopamine system to kick in or I can shut it down. And most people, when they make progress, they, give themselves, they, they still give themselves negative self-talk. Mm. You need to reward yourself when you're winning and then when you're losing, it's not necessarily always about beating yourself up and, and lowering your self-esteem. It's about learning from it and just being completely logical. Okay, you know what? I messed up here. All right. You know what happened? Having a little bit of empathy towards yourself goes a much further way than, than, than 
than trashing on you. Just like if you have someone that maybe is in a more of a position of authority than you, that's always shitting on you, does it make you want to work harder? No. So when you talk to yourself in a really negative way, why would that make you want to work harder? A huge part of that is keeping your eyes on your own paper. I feel mm -hmm. like in life, you want to take things from people and you take thing, something from this person, you take something from that person. But like, it's, it's just a journey for yourself. Yeah. And it's just about you versus you. And when you don't have your eyes on other people's paper, oh, look how much Greg could bench press. Oh, look how much. That's like a, such a negative way to go about life. It's a very negative way. And, you know, even if you take away everyone else and, you, and, and even with your own self, like you have to just be logical. Oh, why did I mess up my diet? Why did I do this? I'm such a failure. Okay, forget about yourself for a second. Even in Power of Now, I totally talks about this. Like, let go of the self, you know? Um, and if you can act more out of logic, okay, I did, okay, forget, it. why did I do this? Why? Okay, you did mess up. Okay, what happened? You know, if you if you get into being going beating down on yourself and, and this and that, it doesn't get you anywhere. You, there's no amount of negative self-talk that makes you a better person or makes you take more action. Like yes. it's it's li literally just be dead ass logical about it. Okay, where did I mess up? All right, let's let, let, let me stop. Like the beating yourself out doesn't do anything. Why did I beat myself up? Okay. You obviously messed up for a reason. You didn't do it because you're, you know, you didn't do it because you're a loser. You know, you did you did it for a reason. Figure out what that reason is and how do we, it's all about, it's all just problem solving. And if you get too emotionally affected, you can't do effective problem solving. What got you started with Eckhart Tolle? Um, and have you read A, a yeah, New Earth? I, uh, yes, I've, I've read them both. Yeah, yes. I, I had a mentor and, uh, and uh, you know, he was, uh, you know, he was like, bro, you got to, don't read a new earth, listen to the audiobook. listen to it every day, listen to it 10, 20 times. It will change your life. Yes. I've seen people read it and they don't get it. They think they understand it. They don't get it. Listen to it 30 times, 40 times, <laughs> do your freaking totally every day. And I was like, okay, you know, I was like, okay. I was like, you know what? This, this person fucking is legit. Let me fucking do it. And you know, at first, first few days I was like, well, what's going on? And then finally it started sinking in. I felt like this amazing chef. For sure, yeah. This book changed my life four years ago. Read it. Hell yeah. And I was just like, oh, I see the ways in which I was operating with ego. Oh, I see this. I was like, whoa. And I, I need to reread it like every- Yeah, listen to the audio, man. It's like meditation. Eckhart's voice. It's insane. Be in the night. <laughs> yeah. I got to listen to it more often. I used to do it every day and I'm not as consistent, but it is very impactful. That daily Eckhart. Yeah. He's got the, That's going to stay with me. Imagine you're walking through fog with a- Flashlight. <laughs> he doesn't know how to say flashlight. Flash <laughs> with a flashlight. <laughs> uh, talk to me about buying Antoinette and your cousin a trip to Hawaii. How'd you hear about that? We do our research here. Holy shit. Okay. Oh, um, yeah. So, I mean, it was this past Christmas. Um, I, you know what's funny? Okay. One of the moments in my life where my dopamine levels were just fucking insane. The strongest my dopamine has ever been. It was when I was at my grandma's cottage, if you want to call it that, this, her, her cottage, like five hours, six hours north of Montreal, in the middle of nowhere, okay? And we were there for two weeks, and there was like nothing, like it was just, there was no TV, no electronics, nothing, okay? But we went to like some Zellers or some department store at some point, and I I, I really want this video game. I love video games. I had the uh, Super Smash Bros. I wanted the Super Smash Bros game so bad. And at the, I do remember the price. Yo, those, those games used to be like 80 bucks, okay? When this, like this is in 95 or 96, $80, okay? They're insane. Video games back then, you think they're like, oh, 20 bucks, okay? Um, it's like $80. And I, and I convinced her to buy me Super Smash Bros. Super Smash Bros was 80 bucks? Pretty damn sure in Canada it was. I don't know about the states. <laughs> Yo, that's Canada, fake money. That's in fake Canada money. was eighty dollars. <laughs> no it was either it was either seventy or eighty bucks. That's a lot. Of it money. was at least sixty, but I'm pretty sure it was eighty. It was like seventy nine dollars. Okay, I remember. I remember numbers. I remember prices. Okay, it was eighty dollars, and I convinced her to buy me Super Smash Bros. Okay, and for like another week, we weren't gonna be back into Toronto where my Nintendo was, and I just was like so freaking excited. Every night after dinner, when I, when I went to bed, I'd put on my lamp, I'd be reading the pamphlet. I'd be reading this damn pamphlet. I'm like, look at the characters I can use. I would be, my dopamine levels were nuts. Um, and most kids at seven, eight years old, they're already scrolling through TikTok and on Game Boys and they're, and then it's very hard to succeed. You don't have control of your mind. That was like insane. My sheer excitement to play Super Smash Bros, 
I've never felt that before. Okay. I've literally never felt that before. Um, and so she bought me that game and she's been very generous with, uh, myself and my siblings. Um, and, and, uh, and you know, I, I, uh, and so her daughter, Caitlin, you know, I think I was having like a nice Cadillac Kino margarita on, on day before Christmas. I was feeling generous. And I said, I asked my cousin, uh, Caitlin, who's like 16 or 17, 17. I said, I said, Hey, would you guys want to go on a trip? She's like, yeah. I'm like, okay, great. I'll, I'll get you guys a trip for like a week. And she's like, oh my God, amazing, amazing. I'm like, do you want to go to like Bahamas or Mexico? And like, she's like, Hawaii. And I'm like, yo, okay, Hawaii is kind of far. <laughs> like it's from Montreal, it's like two flights. And I, I know the Hawaii ain't like, they have certain like good resort deals in Mexico and, and Dominican and, and, and whatever. And I'm like, yo, they don't have that in Hawaii. And so, uh, and so I'm like, shit, okay, damn it. Okay, well, I can't be like, if I'm going to treat someone, I don't want to compromise and give them like the, like, oh, well, let's just do this. All. I'm going to go, I'm just going to go all out, whatever you want. And so she's like, Hawaii. And then I'm like, okay, great. I'm like, here are the different resort options. Ritz Carlton. And then you want to do like seven days or like eight, eight days. And, and so anyways, um, it felt good. My aunt was speechless. She didn't believe it, but it, it, it felt good. You know, once in a while, it's nice to do something like that. And, uh, and uh, no, it felt very, very good. I think they're going on the trip like today, uh, Saturday. I think they left today. Oh, so wow. yeah, synchronicity. No, yeah, synchronicity. So uh, no, I think they're it's very, very good. You know, it's nice to, I work very, very hard and I do very well for myself. And, uh, and also like I've sometimes spent money on stupid shit. Like my flight here, just to fly from Toronto to Miami, which is three hours. I didn't, I could have booked it a few days ago. I didn't book it. And like, there was only one freaking seat. And I was like four grand. What? Yeah, it was like $4,000. You spent $4,000 like to be here? 3,800. <laughs> Yeah, the Canadian. So it's like whatever you want to call it. It's like twenty nine eight hundred US. Stupid. And it was in like American Airlines. Didn't, first class. Uh, it was like it was like a business class. It wasn't the pod. It was like pretty. It was a business class. And, and you know, I will say my my uh, my stewardess wasn't really that great. I was like, hey, can I get sparkling water? It took like an hour. I had to ask her twice. Okay, for four grand, can't even get sparkling water. <laughs> Yeah, but you know what? Honestly, I, I don't regret it. It was worth it. I wanted to, I had to get. I, I was worth it. I'd rather spend four grand than than you know a snowstorm happened. I don't even know if their flights gonna they were gonna happen. Um, and again, we had this podcast. I wanted to show up, so I was like was like thirty eight hundred dollars. Wow, big famous. Yeah. Wow. But the reason why I asked that was about because. You said you've said before that generosity is something that you need to work on, or that you you don't usually do that. Mm. Like that was a rare situation. Well, I am very generous to like you know um, I am generous like if I have a girlfriend, someone I love in my life, I am very giving and I am very loving and and I and I go friends going to dinner, I'm very happy to pay. And so in many ways, I am like generous and gotcha. I, I believe in giving and stuff like that. Um, but in in more in some of those other ways, like I just remember like being a kid, okay, like. And this, this definitely has deterred me from getting as invested in charity as I could be. But as a kid, four or five fucking times a day, these people trying to get on the phone, my mom and my mom being very sweet and, oh, yeah, okay, sure, you know. And just like, they, we got bombarded five, 10, 15 times a day by these people trying to get money for charities. And a lot of those charities, you, where does he, the money even go? And so like, I just, associate given to given to charity to being on some call list where my phone starts ringing 30 times a day and i hate when my phone is ringing any phone call i get I'm like fuck just wow i got my phone ringing like it's very it's very uh it's very you know it's it's to call my phone okay just text me to call me it's a little uh it's, you know a little bit arrogant i was kidding <laughs> well but it is <laughs> take up my time yeah no, but it is funny that people have different ways of preferred communication yeah. And it's like, we don't know this because no one's been taught like, oh yeah, I prefer to text or oh, I prefer to call or I prefer to FaceTime. Mm -hmm. And people have different ways of communicating that they, that they actually like, which is fascinating because it's a new thing that's all happening. Yeah. I, I kind of find a lot of times phone calls can be annoying or at least like text me and then do a phone call. Sometimes it's fine. But like if I'm in a, a work rhythm, it's easier to just look at a message and be like, okay, cool. Then like a phone call, answer it. Hey, what's up? Hey, how are you? Okay. And then what about it? It just, it's not time efficient. Got you. You know, it's not time efficient. Yeah. Talk to me about naming products. Something that you've done tremendously well is your names. The names mm -hmm. you have are, they, they hit you. Yeah. And I know you spend time thinking about that. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because I always discounted naming of mm -hmm. products and things, but it's like I've seen it that the naming itself is part of the product. So how yeah. do you name products effectively? Well, anything I do, release, 
Um, I want to feel like it's fucking cool. I have to feel like this shit's cool because I'm the one that's going to be taking it probably more than anyone else. I'm the one that's using it. I want it to feel cool. So that's the first thing. Anytime I release a product, I'm really just releasing something for myself and sharing it. That's how I view any product I do. I'm releasing something, I'm creating something for myself and then I'm sharing it. I'm creating this workout for myself and then sharing it. Um, and so I have to feel like it's cool. This is effectively for me. And uh, I care about names. Names I think are actually pretty important. Um, and I've always kind of like, like really cool, like cool names. So I take my time and I, I'm an idea person. I throw things out there and I'm like, oh no, that's shit. And you gotta, you gotta give yourself permission to come up with some shit ideas for the good stuff to come out. Um, but I, I, a, it just kind of comes to me, man. It's like a gift. I think like it just comes to me. I just sit on it. I'm open-minded. I put my phone away. And I'm like, what is this name? I'll sit on it a few days. And every time I've released something, like it just felt right. I really, you know, I mean, Kino body was very, very cool. Um, you know, like I did different things like movie star body, warrior shred, aggressive fat loss, all very cool. Kino octane. I was in a car and I was coming up the name of the pre-workout with one of my business partners at the time. And I was just like pre-workout, like pulse pump. No. And it was just like, like, what is a pre-workout? It's like energy. It's like fuel, like, okay. Fuel energy. What else? Cars, right? High, like octane is like the, is like the fuel, right? O Kino Octane, it sounds sick. KO, Kino Octane. And then, you know, um, I'd say like uh, Mojo was probably like my most, you know, genius moment of my life. I just, I was like, hey, I'm really seeing that there is ways to naturally increase your testosterone, even if they're in the healthy, normal range. Let's work on this, okay? Boom, like I, I tested all the ingredients out. I was like, this fucking shit is awesome. Let me create a name. And I'm like, a lot of these testosterone boosting names, they're not, the names aren't real with what it actually does. Okay. You're not taking steroids. You're not taking TRT. You're not tripling your levels. It's not some Testro 1000 X. It's not none of that garbage. Okay. What are we doing with this product? I, I get deep into it. And so I'm like, okay, this is a testosterone support supplement. We're supporting your body's ability to produce testosterone. What does that do? Are you going to gain muscle twice as fast? No. Are you going to just turn into some machine? No what is testosterone, you know? Okay. You know, it's, it's that masculine element, right? It's, it's going to give you, okay. What are the benefits we're getting? We're not tripling muscle growth. What are we getting? We're getting a bit more energy, a bit more drive. Our sex drive is higher. Our, we have more passion. Um, we get more excited to train, you know, when you have a bit higher to, when you increase your testosterone, you get more excited to train. It's also, if you ever have a few days of really shitty sleep, training feels like pulling teeth. Part of that is because you're on low sleep. Part of that is also because your levels get suppressed a lot when, when you're sleep deprived. Um, and I'm like, fuck, what are we doing? Okay. And it's like, we're getting our mojo back. It's the mojo. Men have lost their mojo. The fact that testosterone is down 25 to 40% in the last few decades means that men by and large have lost their mojo. The difference between being at like 400 and being at like 600 is, or 550, 600, and the, the drop in, in free testosterone, I actually think is worse than total. Um, but that's the difference between like losing your mojo. Um, and so we're getting that mojo back. Working out is more fun. Sex is more fun. You know, working on your business is more fun. Life is more fun. And so mojo, I was like, fuck, that's a genius. How has no one done this before? People think all these amazing names have already been taken. That's not true. If you tell yourself that, you're not gonna come up with a name. There's still amazing names out there. You have to recognize there's amazing names out there. Try and understand deeply, what is the product? What is it doing? What makes it feel cool to you? If I was like, oh, I'm taking test, test 1000, testro this, testro that, I'd be like, no, I'm taking my Kino Mojo. The Kino Mojo, yeah. I love it. Yeah. I love how you break it down to the simplest elements and try to get to the simplest elements because that's what true knowledge is. Yeah. It's like going to the heart of something. And I've always, with my names, it's always been really about feeling effortless and cool, not trying to be try hard and intense. It's like, even when I go to the gym, I'm not going to the gym in some crazy like fitness outfit. I go to the gym in like whatever I want, a vintage tee and shorts, just a random ass t-shirt. I don't care. I've done workouts with my boots still on. Like I just go to the gym. I don't care what I'm wearing. I'm lifting some weights. And so like with my names, I try and make them feel a bit like effortless, not like try hard. We're trying to be fit. We're trying to be cool. 
Um, and so like Kino Mojo is kind of like, kind of funny, like Kino Mojo, like Austin Power Powers, you know? Yeah. You it's like, we're, we're having fun with it. We're, we're not, we're not trying to be, it's not we're trying to be so intense and hard. It's like this effortless. Yeah. You, you threw an Austin Powers reference earlier there Yeah. in, in the episode where you were fat bastard, you were impersonating. I don't know. If oh, it was, right, right, right. No, I know but, what you're saying. But yeah, what, uh, yeah. what have been some of your biggest influences? from a content perspective, media perspective, or, or just life? Um, early on, it's hard to say. There wasn't really any YouTubers that I actually found uh, that I actually was really, really invested in watching. I never really watched many fitness YouTubers. I kind of just didn't really vibe with um, their content. Um, I kind of did my own thing as far as my content um even the way i when i used to do like day in life vlogs i just didn't really take any sort of inspiration i kind of just did my own thing i would do less quick shots just me on my iphone like chilling like you know girl like longer shots so, like i didn't necessarily take much inspiration from other people as far as my content um i will say in the last couple of years like i i did um I, I did connect with andrew tate um before he popped off on social media when he only had a few hundred thousand followers and i did i did talk to him quite a bit and i and I did see his his content and I, I and it was cool. I liked how he basically would talk about anything. He didn't just stick to, you know, promoting his offer and, and he would talk about, about anything, be candid. I, 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 you know, as far as uh, charisma, I found he was very, uh, in interviews and stuff, very charismatic and, and very like dialed in. So I did, when I saw him, like before he really popped off, I was like taking some notes. I'm like, hey, he really, really knows how to like, capture uh attention he really knows how to like you know really like come across well on, on camera and and he also kind of plays it up a little bit he turns it up a little bit he, even just in not even in what he says he does that of course but in the way he says it he magnifies emotions um which is really really actually really powerful um and uh and and actually you know what to give credit where credit's due i think like when i did that who else ad that really took off who else I just what I what I liked about what he did, and this is also on dopamine, right? Like I think I think the way he he uh, I think he actually trained his dopamine system very well because him and his brother would just be having so much fun. Most people in London or in Europe, they're like start to make money. They're shyest, they're sheepish. Oh, you know, gotta hide it. People don't want people don't like flexing, and he'd be like, "We're flexing on the broke boys and lamb." Like, he just it's like a six year old has a hundred million dollars, and so having fun with it and just telling yourself, "You're so awesome. We have all this." Yeah, it's arrogant but it actually is very good for your dopamine system. It gets you excited. When you punish yourself from having success and oh, I shouldn't share it, it actually takes the fun out of it and it can actually uh, uh, dampen that dopamine response. Um, and again, you know what? Um, uh, they can test this out. Test this out. Don't just take my word as the voice of God. Test your dopamine. Try these different things out. Talk to yourself this way. See what happens over a long enough time frame. Um, but I, I have firsthand experience. Like when you, when you have fun with it and you really like, you know, okay, you're getting, oh, we're having a Lambo. You're like, so it just, the way he, the way he operated was very, very good for motivation. Extremely, extremely good for motivation. Um, and then in that who else video, uh, so one of the things that he would do pretty well, would he would ramp up the way he talked and he would speak like he would just, if he was good, like he would 10 X it. Awesome. Like, you know, um, and so you can be arrogant, some arrogance, it gets people to listen and they like it. When you speak with absolute confidence, you cut through the noise. Um, so a lot of people are kind of raised and we're actually raised, oh, you know, don't stand out, you know, you know, kind of like, you know, you don't want to upset people. You don't want to break a few eggs, like just kind of be likable, be likable. And so the way that most kids are raised is to be likable, okay? And that's fine, right? The problem with that is that you fit in and it's very hard to separate from the pack when you're focused on being likable. And yes, you don't wanna be a dickhead, and yes, you wanna be kind, and yes, you wanna treat people well. All of those things are extremely important, okay? But if you're gonna separate from the pack, you have to be willing to take a little bit of heat, and you have to be able to like raise the noise, raise the temperature a little bit. You just have to do it in calibrated ways, like you can do it the wrong way and, and just make uh, a mess for no reason. Um, but by like, being, by, by kind of being like, yeah, I am the fucking shit. And like, yeah, this is freaking awesome. And like, who else is doing it? Who else? It's like people freaking love that shit. And I, and people respond to that. When you see someone that speaks with absolute confidence, absolute conviction, you're like, I want to listen. And then at first you might be like, 
At first, and this is actually very, very normal, okay? And this is actually not a bad thing. At first, when you, someone speaks with absolute conviction and confidence, you're gonna be like, this guy's full of shit. This guy is full of shit. And you keep listening and you're looking to see, okay, is this guy full of shit? You're looking for it and looking for it. And if the proof is there, then you're like, fuck, good, okay? Like, hell yeah. So if you actually have the result and if you're real, you can actually magnify the way you talk, speak with absolute confidence and authority and people will come at you and they'll be looking for the chink in your armor. And as long as they can't find it, they'll be like, fuck yeah. This guy's awesome. This guy's dope. But uh, again, you can't have the chink in your armor. So I mean, uh, when I speak with absolute conviction and confidence, I'm like, well, here's my blood work. Well, here's my eight years of DEXA scans. Well, here's thousands of transformations of insane results. Here's me repping 315 on bench for six reps at 175. Like it's just so much freaking proof. It's like, fuck, okay. Well, no one else is showing that. So, all right, fucking, I'm buying this program. So you have to be able to back it up. But if you can back it up, you can magnify the conviction and the, the, the conviction in how you speak. You mentioned before about Andrew Tate, and I'm curious what you think of him, his imprisonment and him being held in. Right. Well, I mean, obviously anyone like kind of watching, um, like going off the evidence, it just seems a little bit off, right? Like I haven't seen any sort of like, uh, any sort of like victims really come forward. It just seems like it's, it, it seems a little bit shady, right? What do you think? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Really, that's why I'm curious from your know. perspective. It's, just, it's, it's like, I mean, like, I think he's been locked up for like three months now to keep extending it. Um, there's no charges that have been made. Um, some of the women that were called victims have come forward and been like, no, I'm not a victim. It's not, it's not true. It didn't happen. So all of that sort of evidence, it just makes it seem silly. Like, I think in the very beginning, a lot of people were like, oh my God, what do you do? This is terrible. But then as time has elapsed, you know, you see CTV footage of, of the supposed victims walking around getting pizza. So, I mean, if you actually just look at the evidence, it's, it's actually pretty scary that, you know, that um, in certain places they can actually uh, kind of, uh, you know, do what they want. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, so it is a little bit, a little, it is a pretty uh, sad to see, you know, I think uh, continuing his jail sentence and holding is, is, I don't know, do you see, I don't see any evidence to keep him inside um and i don't see the threat so yeah it's actually pretty sad it's wild just that there's no there's been no look, trial I'll, look well i'll say this if he didn't erupt to massive amounts of fame he wouldn't be in jail if he didn't have the crazy influence that he had um however you judge that influence whether you think it's positive or negative um good or bad um if he did not have that influence i have a very hard time seeing that that things would have played out the exact same way it did. Um, obviously, a lot of people do not like him having that level of influence. Um, so I don't think it's, I think there's a connection there. Interesting. Yeah, it, it's just- But know, I think everyone thinks this. Everyone, every, everything I'm saying, it's not like, it's not like I'm saying some crazy theory. I think everyone, even people that support him and even people that don't support him probably can agree. Yeah, this is, okay, I'm not seeing the evidence. I'm looking into it. I'm not seeing any, crazy story here. Um, I see almost proof that almost supports him and yet he's still in jail and much of the world does not like him. Uh, much of the world wants to cancel him. They want to cancel him from social media. It just like, it just, the way it's played out um, looks like there's a link between his popularity and th them holding him in jail. So, I mean, it, it is bad. No matter if you like him or not, it is a bad thing. You don't want to live in a world um like that we've never seen somebody blow up so fast and and hit people at such a deep level why do you think that he resonated with so many people um i mean you know what like he was very entertaining to watch he was extremely extremely entertaining to watch and he uh had a voice that that very few people could could i think there's a lot of people that tried to sort of say similar things as him but they weren't cool um, or they came like, you know what, if, if, here's the funny thing, right? There are people that have certain messages as him, but kind of come off as like assholes and, and dickish in, in interviews to his credit. If, if anyone that doesn't like him, if they watch his long form content, he's actually very likable in long form content, mm -hmm. even with people that, um, he doesn't just agree with. He's very respectful. The way he's able to actually share his thought and his argument is actually very well done with women, especially. Um, so he actually like has a, he's, he's a, you know, almost like a cartoon character, right? He's a cartoon character, um, 
professional kickboxer, got the cars, the Lambos, tons of money, living life on his terms, you know, living all over the world, traveling, um, perhaps beautiful women too. And so he has like this kind of aspirational lifestyle that a lot of young men find enticing. And then he's hilarious. And a lot of times like him in interviews, he's playing a certain role. He's playing up a role. Like sure, it's grounded in some of his, in his beliefs, but he's having fun with it. He's, he's, he's making it entertaining. He's not just saying it like, you know, like just, he's not just saying it to say it. He's like making people laugh. Um, and so in his content, like if you watch it, it's actually very fun to watch. And, you know, he was, you know, one of the few people that would speak out about certain things that you were not supposed to speak out about um, and do it with a decent amount of platform and do it on big interviews. And a lot of the people that even didn't agree with him, they loved the fact that he would speak out on certain things. Um, so it almost felt like, yeah, it felt like, uh, to, I think a lot of people felt like it was an important voice to get out there in a unique way. Um, and again, if the world and landscape was very different to how it is now, maybe people wouldn't have, it wouldn't have cared as much because, okay, cool. Like, you know, but the, with the way things were becoming, it almost felt like in the way that the government, like, you know, even if you listen to him talk about um, how the government acted during the pandemic and stuff, it's, it's pretty important. And no one else, who else, you know, actually who else was speaking <laughs> out in such a way? Yeah. Um, you know, he did it very well. He did it in a very uh, entertaining way and he did it and, and he did it very successfully. Um, so, you know, I don't think he needs to be as controversial as people made him out to be. Um, maybe some of the things, you know, people don't agree with and maybe some of the things he goes too far on, but I don't think he should be that controversial. I think the amount of influence he had and people that with low IQ seeing certain clips and, and, and taking it 10 times, you know, not understanding, uh, things from outside of context. But if you watch all the interviews and uh, all the long form content, like, I don't think he's that controversial. I think there's people that are way more controversial. Well, what was interesting to me is I saw him get better as a communicator mm -hmm. and I don't mean that. So it was wild because I'd watch an interview from him in 2020 and then I'd watch one from 2022 and I'd be like, wow, he got better at expressing his point in a clearer way, in a more charismatic way, in a way that got people excited or, or got mm -hmm. people to hate it. And I thought that was so fascinating because it just shows like, the reps and the feedback that you get and how you could get better as a communicator by just putting yeah. stuff out there. Yeah, and, he, and you know what? He had very, very, very good advice for young men. Exceptional advice. Um, you know, play the hand that you're dealt. Um, and, uh, you know, life's not fair and this is the way it is, but you gotta play, like, this is the chessboard. You gotta play it the best you can. Most people are complaining about the chessboard. They're complaining about their hand. They're victimizing. And uh, and also some of the, mm -hmm. some of the, some of that crew or whatever you can call some of the, uh, that culture, um, they're kind of like anti-women and women this, women are going to ruin your life, women that, and that's kind of bullshit and I don't like that. And, you know, and like, I think he has a, a more of like, you know, he doesn't have that view. Um, and again, I think like the most mature place to be is is not to kind of be in, in not to, to have one extreme turn into another extreme, but to kind of find that middle ground. And I think, you know, uh, like men and women, obviously deeply, I mean, even Eckhart Tolle says that um, on a very deep level, right? Um, you know, we're complete, but on, but on like the the level of like masculine, feminine, we're incomplete, and that mm. incompleteness is felt as attraction. Why are you know why am I attracted to you know a beautiful woman um, for that feminine energy, and why is she attracted you know the masculine? And so that polarity is experienced as attraction, and I think life becomes very very good when you are with someone that you love when you love deeply and to kind of tell yourself oh women are going to ruin your life women this it's it's really not the highest quality of life to be had um and so i think like you know i think he understands that i think he practices that in a certain way and everyone is free to live the life how they want to um but you know i think that a lot of other people in sort of this different culture or whatever you want to call it are anti-women and then there's a certain culture they're anti-men and both those are inherently wrong mm. This has been a tremendous amount of fun and I'm really grateful for our time together. I'm curious. I like to end these podcasts with a challenge for people mm -hmm. because we listen to the podcast. We You take out the information. You consumed it for an hour and a half. Now what are you going to do with it in your actual life? Does a challenge come to mind from everything we've talked about or something we haven't covered yet? I mean, you know, the challenge simply is this. Okay. And, and, and also like, the, the last thing I will say um, is that I truly believe that Every single one of us 
we have a, of course, the ability to build an amazing body. I think all of us have the ability to build a really great body, but we have the ability to build a great life and to experience life in a very positive way. And you know, I think more than ever, a lot of people are battling with feeling down and feeling depressed. And do I have dep depression, depression, this and that. And I believe that a lot of times that depression, I, and I have had periods in my life where I felt completely and absolutely depressed. And I've had periods in my life where things felt good, look good and I felt depressed. Um, but I always feel like it's a, uh, it's a feedback tool. Your brain is telling you the way you're living your life, the way you're, that you're taking care of yourself, um, the structure of your life um, is, it's feedback that something's out of alignment. And it could be so many different things. It's not easy to solve. That's the thing. In some cases, it can be hard to solve. In some cases, it can be easier to solve. Um, but I think that all of us, we're capable of having a great life and experiencing a great life and feeling good um, and waking up feeling great, not waking up and feeling freaking depressed and down and can't do anything about it. Um, so I would say one, um, wake up, listen to, before you look at your phone for 10 or 20 minutes a day, at least 10 minutes, listen to power of now audiobook. Let's go. Listen to power of now. If, if everyone listened to power of now 20 minutes a day for a month, things would shift in such a crazy way. You, you wouldn't even understand. Um, cause it, it ripples across in so many different ways, it, interactions and, and how you treat people and, and stuff like that. Um, listen to Power of Now 20 minutes every single day. Um, write down goals. Do a little bit of a journal, okay? And try and take complete and absolute, absolute responsibility for where you are right now in your life, okay? Whether you're not having the success in, in relationships, as in dating, in work, in business, um, take absolute responsibility for where you are right now and start to set some small goals. And as you, set, as you start to make wins, get yourself pumped up, okay? This is so important. Bless you. Oh, that's a big one. Thank you. But that is why I say listen to power of now because that will a lot of times people have a hard time creating change because they're living out their past yes. and their past identity, right? Or they're, they're, they're not able to experience and really transform because their idea of transforming is this future moment. And every day to that future moment is a pain in the ass. It's a, a, it's a, it's a means to an end. So when you can actually enjoy the moment to your goals and cut the ties from the past of who you tell yourself that you are and power of now it helps you do that. You listen to it because when you can fully immerse yourself in the present moment, the past loses its power over you and you can really truly create the future you want when you're present because you cannot create the future you want when you're thinking about, oh, you know, we've got this long way to go. It's only when you're in the moment. Um, and listen to power of now 20 minutes every day, do some journaling, take responsibility of where you are right now and uncover where you want to go. And if you are feeling depressed and down, you're not happy with it, you must become the best problems of your own life, okay? Great, that's feedback for you. Why are you feeling down? Most people that feel depressed, right? If, if you were to do an audit, if they were to audit their own life, of course you're depressed. Of course you are, right? Of course you are. You're smoking weed a lot. You're scrolling through uh, social media all day long. The way you talk to yourself in your own thoughts is completely and absolutely horrible and negative. It's gonna force you into depression. Um, you're, you, you haven't set any goals. You're not living, you must create you must understand your highest values and start to live in accordance to those highest values. Um, you're not making enough time for the gym. You know, and again, it, it might be all of these. It might only be one of these. It might be two of these. Um, and you know, you're, you're not having time to really truly be present. Um, you're not necessarily eating the best diet. You're looking at yourself in the mirror. You're not happy with what you see. If you start to meditate, if you start to, uh, take care of your body, get your steps in, get outside, get, get fresh air, work out, improve on yourself understand your highest values, act in accordance of that, um, limit alcohol, cut out weed, cut out drugs, um, maybe do a little mushroom once every <laughs> couple of times a if year. If you're over 25. Yeah, do those things and start to really gain empathy with how you talk to yourself and really start to like treat yourself better. Um, you know, a lot of stuff would go away. Take even like, you know, certain magnesium and stuff is good, right? Um, uh, if you were to start to like literally just go on a journey of how can I live my highest life and how can I feel my best and start to go down that journey, I think that 99.99% of people would, would find that they are, they are, they are in incredible, in incredible shape. And, and, you know, unfortunately there's a lot of people that go on antidepressants and it doesn't do much for them. And it's, they feel very disenfranchised and some people like have issues on those. Um, and I feel like from the people I talk to in the, in the case studies I've seen, I think people are way too quick to jump on prescriptions. They're so fast to. And I'll ask them, I'm like, why did you do it? Oh, you know, my psychiatrist told me to. Of course she did, you know, but why? And then, you know, how is that going? Oh, you know, I don't really feel better. I kind of feel kind of numb. I'm like, 
how is it affecting your life? Okay, why are you staying on? Oh my, sorry, doctor, psychiatrist told me to. I don't know if I'm gonna get flack for saying this, man, but like the writing is on the wall. You cannot, you have to empower yourself. You cannot give so much power over your own brain, your own mental health to a doctor or, you know, someone that doesn't care about you. Again, look, if it's creating an amazing difference in your life and it's helping you and, you're, and you've tried exhausting other options and that allows you to have the highest quality of life, I'm not gonna fight it, okay? But I think in most cases, right, it, it's, it's not. And, uh, and I don't like seeing people, adults, full-grown adults, um, that just relinquish all power away from themselves to someone else. And then even, even when the, you know, it's, even when the writing's on the wall and you know, you're not feeling your best. So I, here's my lesson. You must become your best own problem solver. You have to solve your own problems. It's very, very important. And I've always felt like that. I've never looked for other, I've looked, looked to learn from other people, but in the end, I have to make the decision. I have to solve my own problems. And I do believe that the highest quality of life out there is really, you can be had. It can be had, and 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 uh, and I've I've had periods where I definitely felt depressed, and that and absolutely, and I've always been like, hey, I can solve this, I can figure this out, I can get out of this, and then uh, and then again, it's not like some I'm set for life. It's something you have to work at every single day, and uh, you know, and and again, and last thing I'll say is like people are scared of feeling negative emotions. They're scared of feeling hurt. They're scared of feeling negative. They're scared of feeling down. And again, it's, that's the life experience. You're gonna feel good emotions, you're gonna feel bad emotions. You cannot be scared of feeling negative emotions. If it's there, allow it to be there, okay? And if you allow it to be there, it's not as bad as you think. Um, and our society has become so soft and, and, and curtailed that like we're scared of, feel, so we're just trying to keep ourselves in comfort. And the biggest thing that's gonna push you into depression is always trying to find comfort. The more you chase comfort, the more you feel depressed. The more you try and be happy, I'm happy, I'm happy. Someone, I had this debate with someone. I think it was a date I had. I don't even know when it was um, in New York. And uh, and she's like, I just want to be ha happy. Like, that's important to be happy. Fuck happy. Happy is bullshit. Okay. Or even like, like the idea of trying to be happy all the time is garbage. Complete garbage. Like, just take drugs all day. It's not real. You can you can work to feeling be feeling fulfilled every day. You can work to have meaning, to have responsibility. And sure, you can have glimpses of feeling really happy, but it's not lasting. And to, to, to the idea that you should be happy is complete and absolute garbage. It's wrong. Um, so I would impress people to actually understand that there's always gonna be negative emotions. Don't fight it, allow it to be there and work to feel fulfilled, work to work hard, work to have meaning, to have love. And that's where you'll have the highest quality experience and, uh, and live your life in the way that supports your highest values. You're an adult now. Like for anyone listening, you're an adult now, okay? In, as a kid, you have gym class, you have drama, you have fucking math, you have this, after school activities, homework. You must create your life in the most productive way to uh, fulfill you. Um, and if you can't do that right now because of X, Y, and Z, don't make excuses. Don't just, oh, I can't do it, you know, blah, 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 blah. find a way, you know, make shit happen. Do you think no one else in your position has ever achieved what you want to achieve? It's been done. Things have put the gun to your head. If I really freaking want this, and that's the last thing I'll leave you with, if you really want to achieve something, you can do it. If you understand that, if you really truly want it and you're willing to put in the work, you can get it, um, then there's no more victimhood. Um, but again, listen to Eckhart Tolle, journal, take absolute responsibility, set your goals and start reading your goals every day and start making, making shit happen. Have you ever watched any of those Greg Plitt motivational videos where it's working out to music and he's playing, he's just speaking bars after bars after bars and it's it's the greatest thing ever have you yeah, seen yeah those? i've seen those they're great they're really someone great. should take the challenge that you just did mm -hmm. take the last 10 minutes fucking put some training footage mm -hmm. and put some music in the background and that will be just an incredible video i might have pablo do this let's do it man video king it. pablo i'll do it i'll have one of my guys do it too you know <laughs> dude that was incredible thank you thank you so much for your time dropping wisdom left and right yeah you're going for the handshake oh, let's go fucking yeah. Canada, baby right. um where can we send people to connect with you further um yeah sure my website's kinobody.com k-i-n-o body.com and i'm on instagram at grow gallagher and i'm also hitting the, the tweets these days i see you on twitter I'm, elon sees you on twitter i'm hitting the grego gallagher tweets so instagram twitter my website and i'm on youtube too kino body i'm all over um but you know definitely hit me up on instagram or twitter we love to see it we'll all linked below thank you so much awesome. for your time my pleasure man